One of the hardest parts in building a home stereo system is trying to decide which set of speakers to buy. It's so, so stressful. I don't know why it's so stressful. I have gone through so many sets of speakers over the years, from vintage to modern, floor standing to bookshelf. I have bought and sold so many, but I think I have finally found a forever pair of speakers. And those would be my new to me vintage Klipsch Heresy speakers. So in this video, I wanna tell you a little bit about how I found them, what I paid for them, how they sound, how I was able to identify exactly what model they were within the long line of Heresy speakers. And lastly, let's actually ask if this will be the last pair of speakers I ever buy. Let's tackle all that next. Before we get up close and personal looking at these speakers, I wanted to point out that these were released in 1984. And it took me a minute to sort of determine what model number, number these were because they've been released as early as the 50s all the way up until now with the Model 4 versions. And uh, while I was looking at these on Facebook Marketplace, I just couldn't tell and the person didn't have it. He just had them listed as Clips, Klipsch Heresies. It's really hard to say Klipsch Heresy over and over. I'm probably just gonna stick with Heresy because there's too many in there. Anyway, so what I determined is that they, uh, there's the Model 1 and the Model 2. And what I actually have is Model 1.5, which is actually not a correct designation from Klipsch. They never actually released something called the 1.5. Um, this is actually, they came out in between the 1 and the 2 with some changes to the design and they've sort of been dubbed 1.5 over the years. Now, I'm gonna actually get up and close and show you how I was able to make that uh, determination. A lot of people will say I should have just looked up the serial numbers and maybe be able to figure it out from there, but, um, but I didn't have those serial numbers ahead of time. And uh, so I was able to get some information before I went that helped me sort of determine that they were the 1.5 model. So before I grab the camera and get up close, just wanted to mention I just got back from Cincinnati and bought pretty big box full of records and uh, I am not going to be able to keep all of these and I'm going to start selling records through my email list. So if you're interested in buying records, uh, please consider going down into the uh, description box below. You can join the mailing list there. I've yet to actually list any there for sale. I'm still trying to kind of figure out the best way to do that. But once I do, I'll be able to have, um, you know, records like these for sale, which is a great copy of Miles Davis there. I just love this Thelonious Monk. This is a German press, but look at that funky cover with that weird ear thing there going there. Uh, there were a handful of original press of uh, Bob Marley records in there. Um, there is a uh, Nina Simone. What else is in there? Oh, lots of Bob Dylan, including some European uh, issue of uh, Bob Dylan records and uh, even a couple Tom Waits LPs. So if you're interested in um, in purchasing records that I list for sale over time, please consider join, joining that mailing list below. Okay, let's get into it. I'm gonna grab the camera. We'll get up and close and personal with these speakers next. Now Klipsch released a lot of these speakers since the 1950s and it can be a challenge sort of determining what actual model number they are. are they one, two, three. Obviously they're not four because four are the newly released ones, but I was having trouble sort of figuring out which uh, year these were. And by all the research that I did online, the, I found one thing that really helped me determine, and you may know of some others, but this is what basically did it for me. And that is this squawker horn here is plastic. It's not metal. So um, in the 1980s, when this speaker was released, they changed this over to a uh, plastic horn instead of metal. Um, this tweeter on here is the K77 and uh, the woofer is the K-22-K. But it was this plastic squawker horn here that helped me sort of identify um, that it was released in the 80s. Well, looking at the back of the speaker, uh, you'll see here the sticker here is still in place with the serial number 8428920 now the other speaker over there it's not sequential unfortunately so i don't have 919 or 921 it's not far off but it's not exactly there so let me know in the comments below if that's just a horrible thing or not um i know the guy who bought it from me bought it from the original owner so i guess whenever he bought them that's just the way they came so i'm not sure what the advantage is of having them be uh, sequential or not. 
uh, so let me know. I'm not going to remove all these screws and take off the rear, but um, the, the last owner did put uh, some sort of better speaker connects on here, which is kind of nice. So the other thing about this model here is that um, over the years, uh, Heresy had four different types of crossover, C, D, E, and then E2. So these have E2, which basically means that there's a 32, 30, excuse me, 33 microfarad capacitor um, in the woofer circuit that was, uh, and that was actually replaced and upgraded uh, with sort of an approved capacitor um, by the person I just bought this from. So it's kind of nice to already have that taken care of. One of the reasons why I think I got a, uh, a little bit of a better deal than what I normally see these selling for is you can see that there is some damage to this uh, original birch case here. So it's mostly around the edges. Uh, like for instance, up here, you can kind of see where uh, that notch kind of came out of there. Now, uh, the person I bought it from said that they never applied any stain to the um, the cabinet here and said the previous owner never did either. So I don't know, it sort of looks at times like they did, but it kind of depends on the lighting, I guess. So uh, to be honest with you, I probably got these about 200 bucks less due to some of these little notches taken out here and I'm actually okay with that. You can't even really see them from where I'm sitting from. And uh, you know, it's not the end of the world for me to have some of these. It's the same situation on the other speaker over there. Just, it's almost like when they got moved around over the years, some of this just kind of snapped right off. You may be wondering why I specifically was interested in buying the Heresy speakers. And for me, it really comes down to one feature and that's our high sensitivity rating of 99 decibels. Now I know I've watched the YouTube videos, I've read all the articles and I understand that uh, the way Klipsch measures their sensitivity is different than how other brands measure. So it's usually not necessarily as high as it says. On paper, I've done all that research and am aware of that. But I also know that even at the sensitivity rating as it may actually measure versus what they say on paper, it's high enough that it would sound great with a low powered tube amp. And I actually have a six watt per channel tube amp that was sent to me for review. Now I'm gonna make my own video about that tube amp, so I don't wanna give away too much um, on this about the speakers, but I can tell you that um, I had listened to that um, tube amp with some other bookshelf speakers that I had and just wasn't really that impressed. But I knew that six watts per channel really needed high sensitivity speakers. And that's what got me looking for a pair of Heresies. And once I bought them and hooked them up to this amplifier, I could really then hear the difference versus the other uh, more lower sensitivity speakers that I had. And so for me, as I began to review more gear and hopefully even more low powered tube amps, I wanted to be able to have a set of speakers that I could actually properly, you know, listen to those lower power um, tube amps and, you know, be able to actually hear what I should be hearing. And that's what drew me to the heresies. And that's what makes me happy that I was able to find these. That leads me into price. What exactly did I pay for these? I think it's worth noting that I live in the Nashville area and Vintage Gear sells fairly quickly here and at a pretty decent price. I had seen two or three pair of heresies all listed between $800 and $850 over the last couple months. And by the time I kind of got around to thinking maybe I should make a low ball offer, they had already sold. So when these popped up at $600, $625 on Facebook market, I jumped at the chance to buy them. In fact, I messaged the seller that night. I drove out on my lunch break the next day. I made him an offer of $600 and that's what I was able to take them home for. So I'm actually happy at $600. Every time I mention what I paid for vintage gear on, on YouTube, uh, the, the people come out in comments and tell me that I overpaid. And they always tell me I overpaid for the condition that I bought these in. So 
I look forward to reading the comments telling me that I shouldn't have paid $600 for these speakers with the cabinets, with the chips out. But honestly, I've never seen them listed for anything lower than that. Honestly, anything lower than $800. So I jumped on it, I bought it. The chips, they don't bother me that much. I'm excited to actually have these pair or have a pair of these speakers at just 600 bucks. The most important question you may be asking is, how do these speakers sound? It's worth noting that I've been using just regular, more modern bookshelf speakers before uh, purchasing these Heresies. Um, and they were uh, Klipsch RPM 600 Mark II, I think, bookshelf speakers, and some Emotiva B2 Plus. So both of those on the sensitivity ratings were uh, much lower than these. They were also uh, traditionally sat up higher on stands, and I have yet to actually um, get my stands. I do have those on order, and um, a friend of mine is making me those stands, um, and he's in Alabama, his name's George, and he has a, you can follow him on his Instagram account, Wood and Wax, I'll include a link below. So if you're interested in um, ordering a set of speaker stands for yourself, please reach out to George. He's one of my hi-fi favorites and would be happy to help you out. So until those arrive, I actually just have them tilted backwards with a textbook wedged up underneath it. Now, uh, one of the things I've learned over the last year of posting videos on YouTube is that people are not gonna actually watch this all the way through and I'm gonna get all these comments saying, you should put those speakers on stands. So for everyone that didn't watch it all the way through and are gonna tell me that within the first minute, leave a comment and move on, Thank you for that. Uh, I actually have them on order. Uh, so I'm actually looking forward to even getting more listening time with them on stands. But what I've noticed is just a larger soundstage, more detail in the upper and mid range. And I think that's what I've really been looking for when, um, when testing gear. Um, you know, I was a big bass guy for many years, you know, high school, college, you know, you really enjoy lots of bass. If you're someone that is still in uh, very much interested in big booming bass, these speakers are most likely not going to be for you unless you pair them with a subwoofer. And I know several people that own these and they pair them with a subwoofer and then they're happy. I'm not a big subwoofer guy. And in fact, a lot of the stuff I listen to nowadays, um, more jazz type music, these speakers sounded awesome with that. Now, in regards to gear, uh, these sounded great with that low power tube amp. Again, I'm gonna save the specifics for that, uh, for exactly how that sounded for another video. But even like, even these class D amps that I've like, just keep multiplying around here. <laughs> even these plugged in with considerable amounts of power, um, you know, anywhere from 50 watts and up they have even sounded great. Um, the Sony STR-DH190, uh, uh, more modern day receiver, um, that has sounded awesome. And it, even including um, more vintage receivers that I've paired with this. I'm blabbing on to tell you that I've yet to found an amplifier at any power rating that has sounded bad with these speakers. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier, that's what's really important to me as I review gear. I wanna be able to have a set of speakers that can handle any power rating and be able, so I can hear what I should be hearing rather than having to constantly be moving speakers around and trying to match them for whatever rating the, the amplifier is. Um, I've loved listening to jazz. To be honest with you, I even threw on a copy of the Roots Phrenology LP. I'm looking at it because it's right over there. Um, the recent Vinyl Me Press uh, version of that because that is a very like, it, it's mastered really hot and I have listened to it on certain, uh, you know, pieces of stereo gear and it's distorted, especially in the bass. And it, there was no distortion through these speakers. The, the bass was there. Like to me, it sounded exactly how I would want it to be. It's more balanced. It's not in your face. It's also worth noting that when I was listening to these speakers with the tube amp and some of my other gear, that I'm not adjusting the tone controls a lot. So I like to kind of keep things in the 12 o'clock position if there are tone controls, but a lot of times I use my Shit Saga S uh, um, preamp here. I don't know why I just sort of spaced out on what I was talking about there, but the Shit Saga Plus preamp, and it doesn't actually offer tone control. So, um, and I have found the bass to be adequate, which means if you do have like one of these uh, Class D amps, 
with tone controls, you'd be able to probably give yourself more bass than even what I'm hearing. But um, it, like I said, if you're really, really into bass, you may want to uh, consider these only with a subwoofer. But if you really love like jazz or classical or especially like acoustic music, these speakers have been a joy to listen to, especially with this tube amp. Try not to give it too much away. Um, but any amp that I've hooked up to, all of those, um, all genres have sounded great. And I have just really, really fallen in love with these speakers and so happy to be able to uh, listen to this gear that's uh, arriving daily to review with these heresies. Okay, so are these really the last pair of speakers I'll ever buy, my forever speakers? Uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> um, I can think of a brand right now that I would love to hear that I've read a lot about but have never actually heard. Um, a more modern brand like Zoo Audio Dirty Weekend. I think those speakers would be fun to listen to. Um, but I think what I mean by these speakers being my forever speakers is I'm not gonna be looking to sell these speakers in order to buy another pair. I think I'm, I'm gonna wanna keep these in the collection for as long as I can. And if I ever maybe do stumble on some other great pair of speakers that I would love to listen to, I'll have to figure out a way to buy those without uh, selling this. And for all of us that are out there constantly uh, buying gear, uh, we're, we're familiar with the burden of having to choose oftentimes what we need to sell in order to raise the funds uh, to buy new things. But I think I'm going to hold on to these for as long as I can. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was an amplifier that sounded really great with these speakers, which is a very uh, budget receiver from Sony, the ST. RDH 190 that I think you can get on Amazon for like 200 bucks. To be honest with you, I did not expect much from that receiver and it turned out to really surprise me. If you want to know more about that receiver, you can do so by watching my review video here.